coming up on Network Africa. Zambia's first president, Kenneth Kaunda, buried after court rejects family's appeal. Deadline looms for South African police to arrest former president, Jacob Zuma. Plus, Zimbabwe returns to strict lockdown amid vaccine shortages. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo La Shubowale. We begin in Zambia, where founding president Kenneth Kaunda has been laid to rest at a memorial site for former presidents after the High Court rejected an application from one of his sons contesting where he should be buried. A hero in the struggle for Southern Africa's liberation from colonialism, Kaunda was accorded four military honours in a funeral that brought together rival political parties and dignitaries from the region. Kaunda died last month, aged 97. Earlier, President Edgar Lungu led family members and politicians at a final church service. While Kaunda is recognized for building a peaceful nation, in death his own family was divided over his final rest in place. Some boycotted the burial in protest. According to them, he had wanted to be buried not among former presidents, but at his farm next to his wife. A court denied the wish, citing public interest. Over in South Africa, an unprecedented legal drama is gripping the country as former President Jacob Zuma urges the courts to block a midnight deadline for police to arrest him. Mr. Zuma was forced to resign in 2018 after nine years in power. Last week, South Africa's Constitutional Court sentenced him to a 15-month jail term for contempt of court after he failed to attend a corruption investigation. It's unclear whether police will stand by the deadline. In theory, the 79-year-old should be in the hands of prison authorities by midnight, having already refused to hand himself in on Sunday. But on Tuesday, his lawyers approached the High Court in Pietermaritzburg to halt the arrest, and the judgment isn't due until 11.30 on Friday. To the Tigray crisis, medical charity MSF has suspended its work in some parts of the Ethiopian region two weeks after three of its staff were killed there. In a statement, MSF called for an immediate investigation into the killings and insists that aid workers are allowed to do their jobs in safety. Almost two weeks since the murders, no one has claimed responsibility and the circumstances around the deaths remain unclear. The MSF describes the decision to suspend work in Abiyadi, Adrigat and Aksum as extremely painful but necessary. Meanwhile, Ethiopia's human rights chief has called for the political crisis in the country to be resolved, saying it has led to widespread conflict and human rights abuses. Daniel Bekele, the chairman of Ethiopia's Human Rights Commission, EHRC, says the biggest problem is a political one, which has resulted to widespread atrocities and a humanitarian crisis. Mr. Daniel says Ethiopian politics has become extremely polarized, largely along ethnic lines. There are also signs of polarization along religious lines in some areas. The ERC is currently undertaking a joint investigation with the UN over the alleged atrocities in Tigray, the main flashpoint of conflict in Ethiopia. While well, the U.S. State Department says the unilateral ceasefire in Ethiopia's Tigray region needs to be followed up with concrete changes on the ground to end the conflict, stop atrocities and allow unhindered humanitarian assistance. The U.S. is also calling for the full withdrawal of Eritrean and regional Amara forces from Tigray and for the authorities to ensure unhindered and safe humanitarian access to the people in need. Of course, we all saw... Uh, the announcement of a unilateral ceasefire late last month, June 28th, I believe it was. Uh, what we know is that unilateral announcement needs to be followed up with concrete changes on the ground to end the conflict, to stop the atrocities, and importantly, to allow safe 
and unhindered humanitarian assistance. The people of Tigray have and continue to suffer tremendously. And the ability of this humanitarian assistance to enter the region unimpeded and unhindered uh, is of paramount importance to us. We call on all armed actors uh, to commit to an immediate, indefinite, negotiated ceasefire uh, so as to achieve these shared objectives. And they include uh, to end the violence, to restore stability to Tigray, and going forward to create a context for inclusive dialogue that preserves the unity, the sovereignty, and the territorial integrity uh, of the Ethiopian state. We further urge all actors and all parties to focus efforts toward resolution of the conflict through, as I said before, inclusive dialogue and to allow fully unhindered humanitarian access uh, to, in fact, expedite the delivery of that uh, humanitarian aid. Well, let's head over to Egypt now, where the huge container ship that blocked the Suez Canal in March, disrupting global trade, is finally leaving the waterway after Egypt signed a compensation deal with its owners and insurers. Witnesses say the Ever Given weighed anchor shortly after 11.30 and headed north towards the Mediterranean, escorted by tugs. The ship had been impounded for three months near the canal city of Ismaila. Terms of the deal were not discussed closed, but Egypt had demanded $550 million. The 193-kilometer Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean Sea at the canal's northern end to the Red Sea in the south and provides the shortest sea link between Asia and Europe. But the vital waterway was blocked when the 400-meter long Ever Given became wedged across it after running aground amid high winds. Global trade was disrupted as hundreds of ships were stuck in the traffic jam. The VOA's Edward Yeranean is in Cairo. He joins us now for more. Ed, good to see you. Uh, after three months, the Ever Given is finally released. You know, there are reports of some sort of ceremony held today. Uh, just talk to us about that and the process. Yes, Kenny, I think the agreement, the actual agreement was made a few days ago and Today, perhaps the money was actually paid. Uh, the chairman of the Suez Canal Authority, uh, Usama Rabia, gave a press conference. They say that the captain of the ship and his crew were given a plaque, and the ship was allowed to set sail uh, from the Great Bitter Lake where it is, was being held uh, around 11.30 in the morning. Now, there was an Egyptian tugboat with reporters that was filming the departure of the ship. Uh, we could see that uh, via the um, Egyptian media outlets that were broadcasting it, and uh, the ship, I guess, is supposed to arrive in, um, in Port Said, which is closer to the Mediterranean, um, perhaps this evening, and I, I guess it needs to undergo an inspection. Well, Ed, what are you hearing about the terms of the deal? And why have authorities been so reluctant to disclose much in this? Well, the Egyptian side has not given any details. And actually, the, the, the Japanese company that is uh, the owner of the ship is not either. Um, apparently, the UK... Uh, insurers uh, gave some information to the Wall Street Journal, according to various press sources, although you could question whether that's correct or not. But they're saying that although Egyptian, uh, Egypt, the Suez Canal Authority, had been demanding $550 million in its final uh, last known demand that uh, Egypt uh, came down to $200 million. Now, that's just the Wall Street Journal uh, quoting some anonymous um, insurer in London, so I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, why are they not uh, giving any details officially? Uh, I guess neither side probably has an interest in doing it. I mean, the insurers probably don't want to uh, indicate what they paid, and Egypt probably doesn't want to admit 
that it's come down on its initial demands. Uh, well, initial initial was, I guess, nine hundred uh, million dollars, close to a billion dollars, uh, which was brought down later to five hundred fifty. And if they came down to two hundred million dollars, uh, and I'm not saying that they did, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, that would be uh, a climb down. Well, the container ship was refloated following a six-day salvage operation that involved tugboats and dragon vessels. Now, sadly, one person was killed during the operation. Do we know if compensation will be given to the family of the victim? Well, Egypt always compensates the victim's family um, in the case of rail accidents, the plane accidents. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say always. I think the government usually makes a move to indicate that it's going to pay this. Uh, but I, I, I don't question that the victim's family will be paid, but probably at, a, at an Egyptian rate rather than an international rate. And if Egypt does get money for the victim at an international rate, they would probably be not paying that particular rate to the family. All right, then. Uh, Ed, just before I let you go... To get your thoughts on another issue, the now dam dispute. Saudi Arabia has thrown its weight behind Egypt and Sudan after Ethiopia began filling the dam's reservoir earlier this week. With these latest developments, what can we expect from the UN Security Council meeting on the issue uh, coming up on Thursday? Well, there's been a lot of speculation uh, in the Egyptian media as to what the UN... Security Council is going to decide. I haven't uh, really, uh, really seen anything I think is credible. I, I don't actually know. Um, it, I guess it depends on who's friends, um, who is friends with Egypt and who is friends with Ethiopia on the Security Council. Uh, and various countries have been probably playing both sides or don't want to indicate what which side they're going to take. Now, um, in the past. Uh, the, United the United States has backed Egypt, uh, at least the former Trump administration, which was uh, hosting negotiations in Washington about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, was supporting Egypt. Um, it's not clear about a lot of other countries on the Security Council. Saudi Arabia, it's normal that the Arab countries would be supporting Egypt, and the Arab League has also been supporting Egypt. But, of course, Saudi Arabia on the Security Council, I believe Tunisia is, um, and it's, uh, you know, anyone's guess whether this is going to remain as a, uh, they're, they're going to take any solid action or just kick the can forward and uh, hope that the situation doesn't uh, erupt into a, a conflict. All right, then, Ed, thank you so much for joining us on the program. My pleasure, Teddy. Well, some updates on the COVID-19 pandemic now. Rwanda has reopened COVID treatment centers after a surge in cases. According to the health ministry, in the last two weeks, the country has recorded nearly 1,000 new cases daily. There are concerns about the Delta variant that has been found in neighboring Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Health Minister Dr. Tasisi Mpunga says the causes of the new surge include low vaccination rates as around just 3% of the population have had the jab. He also mentioned the movement of people across the border after DRC's Mount Inyarangongo erupted in May as a possible reason for the surge. In the last week, the Health Ministry reported 60 deaths from the virus. The authorities have introduced strict measures whereby businesses are ordered to close at 5 p.m. local time and a night curfew starts at 6 p.m. Schools, churches and bars are all closed. Still to come on the program. Well, it's World Chocolate Day and in the perfect way to celebrate, a Belgian Congolese chef opened Senegal's first artisan chocolate shop. That's in a moment. Please stay with us.
Thanks for staying with us still on the COVID-19 pandemic. Zimbabwe has returned to strict lockdown measures in a bid to combat a resurgence of COVID-19 amid vaccine shortages. Officials uh, say to try to contain the spread, most people must stay at home, similar to restrictions adopted in March last year when towns and cities became almost deserted. Infections have soared in recent weeks despite a night curfew, reduced business hours, localised lockdowns in hotspot areas and a ban on intercity travel. The virus is spread to rural areas with inadequate health facilities. Zimbabwe is one of more than 14 African countries where the Delta variant is quickly spreading. Well, Zimbabwean journalist Nigel Yamatumbu joins us now for more on the situation in the country. Nigel, how are Zimbabweans settling into another strict lockdown, essentially like the one imposed last year at the beginning of the pandemic? Is there a high level of compliance? The Zimbabwean government has uh, introduced a raft of measures to ensure that uh, the new COVID-19 regulations are adhered to. And uh, part of this uh, arrangement is to uh, deploy the uh, military uh, and, and uh, other uh, security forces uh, to ensure that there is a full compliance. So yes, I think uh, to an extent there is this adherence uh, to these uh, new lockdown measures. Um, albeit uh, reports of increasing cases and also um, these strict enforcement measures. So uh, by and large, uh, there is this uh, respect for this new regulation. Well, Zimbabwe is one of many African countries tackling a resurgence of the virus, especially uh, with the Delta variant rapidly spreading around the world. What other measures has the government put in place to try and contain uh, the virus? Outside of the enhanced lockdown measures, there are three other efforts that the government has been implementing to try and combat uh, the uh, pandemic. Firstly, by the vaccination uh, program, uh, which uh, has been being rolled out extensively. Uh, with uh, uh, 2 million doses being reported to be coming into the country in the next uh, coming days. Uh, there's also uh, the treatment and containment of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic within uh, the country's uh, hospitals uh, and, 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 and so forth. Um, and then lastly, uh, they, there is uh, an awareness raising uh, program uh, which, in which government has deployed ministers, members of parliament to the respective uh, communities for the country not to be complacent and to continue guarding against the pandemic. Well, you mentioned there that the country is expecting uh, more vaccines in the coming days. We're hearing of shortages in supply of vaccines already. Just give us an update on the country's vaccination drive uh, so far. There were reported shortages in the first phase of the vaccination program. Uh, and uh, I think at some point there was uh, an element of government having been overwhelmed by the number of citizens that had expressed uh, interest in getting the vaccines. Um, and also, I think uh, there was also pressure even coming from within the region uh, and so forth. But I think uh, uh, with the reported 2 million doses coming, uh, the situation might ease. Um, and with the reports of uh, more investment coming, to try and uh, expand the vaccination program, uh, one uh, certainly hopes that uh, uh, more and more people get vaccine and uh, the pandemic will be optimal. All right, then Zimbabwean journalist Nigel Yamatumbu, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed. And now Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, is under fire for launching new projects past curfew hours. President Kenyatta launched five hospitals on Tuesday night and explained that it was necessary to do it at night so as to ensure efficiency in service provision. 
He said the hospitals in the capital, Nairobi, were meant to operate 24 hours and he needed to monitor that. However, Kenyans online accused the president of disobeying his own orders. Kenya's overnight curfew runs from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. local time in the capital and the rest of the country, except for some counties in the west where it starts earlier at 7 p.m. So the story is now, according to Eswatini officials, 27 people were killed in pro-democracy protests last week. Last week, an official had put the death toll at nine, with many others injured. Civil society groups had previously said dozens of people were killed by security forces, many for violating a curfew imposed in the wake of the protest. Meanwhile, the United Nations says the reports of violence in the country are deeply concerning and urges authorities to fully adhere to human rights principles in restoring calm and we the rule the of law. Of to open the eruption of violence in the kingdom of Eswatini in recent days is deeply concerning, amid reports that dozens of people have been killed or injured during protests calling for democratic reforms. We have received allegations of disproportionate and unnecessary use of force, harassment and intimidation by security forces in suppressing the protests, including the use of live ammunition by police. Some protesters were reported to have looted premises and set buildings and vehicles on fire, and in some areas they barricaded roads. We urge the authorities to fully adhere to human rights principles in restoring calm and the rule of law, in particular, the obligation to minimise any use of force in the policing of protests only to that absolutely necessary as a measure of last resort. We also call on the government to ensure that there are prompt, transparent, effective, independent and impartial investigations into all allegations. Now, according to the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, a record 4.5 million children in South Sudan, two out of three, are in desperate need of humanitarian support, with a child mortality rate being among one of the highest in the world, with one in ten children not expected to reach their fifth birthday. The UN agency is strongly appealing to donors to not reduce their contributions for UNICEF in South Sudan. We are actually going through the worst humanitarian crisis since independence. There is nothing between humanitarian assistance and no assistance. And that is why uh, we are appealing for, uh, to donors to really uh, put South Sudan in a separate category where we don't cut because any cuts, again, will result in immediate impact because there is no, uh, it is not a question of a weak government safety net. There is no safety net. Triggering factors include the continuous violence and insecurity, both uh, political uh, uh, violence and armed conflict, as well as uh, intercommunal violence uh, with breakdowns of law and order at local levels, uh, cycles of revenge killing, raids, and so on, as well as the impact of climate change and flooding. And finally on the program, it's World Chocolate Day, a day that allows chocolate lovers around the world to indulge in their favourite treat without any guilt. Well, for one chef in Senegal, it's an extra special day. Forced by the COVID-19 pandemic to abandon plans to open a restaurant, Danuta Nganko settled instead to an even tastier endeavour to open the country's first chocolate shop. Take a look. At the dawn of the COVID-19 pandemic, many chefs saw it fit to hang up their aprons and wait for the storm to pass. Forced by the outbreak to abandon plans to open her own restaurant, Danuta Nganko, a Belgian Congolese chef living in Senegal's capital, Dakar, settled instead on an even tastier endeavor to become the first country's gourmet chocolatier. So when COVID started, then all of my activities stopped. And, uh, and I thought about, you know, working with the product. And, uh, and I thought, why not chocolate? I realized that there was a lack of um, professional chocolatier in Dakar. Like some people would do chocolate, but not only chocolate, and not in a very artisanal way. So I thought there was a lack in the market and I could just jump in it. <laughs> and, uh, and because I really loved, you know, technical type of cooking, I thought it was for me. 
Since then, Nganko has realized a new dream with opening of Venko, Senegal's first and only artisan chocolate company. By fusing Belgian chocolate with locally sourced ingredients, Venko has quickly developed a reputation for blending unique flavors with stylish presentation, making Nganko's chocolate a coveted delicacy among Senegal's confectionery enthusiasts. I worked with uh, Belgian chocolate, but the idea is to, t is to take a very classical chocolate and work it with local flavors. So we worked a lot with uh, Bisap, which is very well known here, but I also try to, to bring back to life flavor that maybe people forget a little bit about, La like Concoron, which is a nut that is almost disappearing. And I hope that moving forward, you know, my work can go as well with helping to put those flavor a bit in fashion and maybe try to save some of those. Named after a bakery established by Nganko's parents during her childhood, a fusion of the couple's last names, Venko has navigated the COVID-19 outbreak by leaning heavily into deliveries and catering for special events. While lacking the cocoa culture of other regional powerhouses like Ivory Coast and Ghana, Senegal's reputation for stability has made it an attractive destination for investors and entrepreneurs, including Nganko. But Nganko has her eyes set on a more ambitious goal than simply making ends meet. She wants to change the way Senegalese people regard chocolate entirely. <laughs> well, to all the chocolate lovers out there, have a great day. <laughs> and that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. And Tenio Lash, Shabo Ali. Bye for now.